Thank you very much, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak about animal flight here. I would like to present uh, my research over the past uh, couple of years uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, my colleagues from France, from Germany, and from Japan. To give some historical perspective, I would like to start with this uh, slide and with this movie uh, to show you that uh, animal flight research is not new. And already more than 100 years ago, uh, there were some, uh, some uh, uh, first uh, uh, video recordings of uh, insect flight of these tiny insects at uh, the frame rate of 1,000 frames per second already. So uh, Etienne Jules Marais developed uh, this kind of uh, machine for, for filming about the same time when uh, cinematography was invented, which is impressive. So, uh, and uh, scientific results in particular, they uh, notice this deformation and uh, uh, figure of eight motion of uh, the wings of animals. Uh, so, of course, uh, over the past uh, years, uh, many experimental techniques from, uh, from fluid dynamics were imported into animal flight research. And here I show you some uh, flow visualization with uh, smoke flow visualization and uh, particle image velocimetry. So biologists are now routinely using these uh, techniques that uh, were developed by fluid mechanics as well for fluid mechanics community. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, now it is uh, with uh, the recent progress in uh, material science and micro robotics, uh, it is now realistic to actually build a small flapping uh, robot. And this is one of the most uh, successful examples uh, of well, a Harbert Robotic B which is uh, about the same uh, size as a real bee, and it can fly by flapping its wings, uh, control its flight by flapping asynchronously, and so on. So uh, there are two communities now that are interested in uh, uh, understanding how insects fly. Uh, first, biologists, because obviously the behavior of insects is uh, partly their flight behavior and their uh, morphology and evolution. Uh, uh, can be explained by uh, considering the fact that they can fly. Uh, on the other hand, there are roboticists who are trying to build these biomimetic uh, micro air vehicles that can be used uh, uh, the other way around to understand how animals fly. So in, in both cases, it is important to, uh, to understand uh, the fluid flow past the flapping wings and uh, that's what uh, is primarily my uh, uh, interest is to uh, model the uh, flow of the fluid past flapping wings of animals. So for that, uh, we have developed uh, a dedicated software uh, that can uh, uh, then can take into consideration the complex shapes of the insect wings and the their body and their dynamics. Uh, so in this talk, I'm going to first uh, present this uh, uh, software, and uh, then I'm going to speak about applications of it to, the, to explore the questions that are, are interesting to biologists, essentially. Uh, so the first part is the numerical method and the software aspect. So, uh, well, uh, this is a Navier-Stokes solver. So we solve incompressible Navier-Stokes equation with uh, uh, no slip boundary condition at uh, the surface of the insect, uh, that is of the wings and of the body, and uh, this can have complex uh, uh, shape. So because uh, the shape can be so complex, we use a volume penalization method, which is a convenient tool for that. So we modify uh, the uh, momentum equation by adding uh, the penalty term here. Uh, in this term, uh, uh, this is what we call mass function chi. It contains all geometrical information. So it is equal zero inside the fluid and one inside the solid. Uh, C eta is uh, a parameter, which is a small value. Uh, and uh, u is the velocity of the fluid, which now occupies the whole domain of the fluid and also the interior of the solid. Uh, and u s is the velocity that we want to prescribe uh, inside the solid body. Uh, 
So in our model, uh, as I said, uh, the fluid is viscous and compressible. The uh, wings are rigid here, but they can move. Uh, so we perform a direct numerical simulation without any turbulence modeling. And we model the boundary condition using the volume penalization method. Uh, just to give you an illustration, uh, well, a bit more information about this method and how it works. Uh, so uh, this coefficient C eta can be interpreted as permeability. So uh, uh, now we assume that there is some uh, fluid inside the solid, uh, but uh, the solid is not uh, uh, impermeable, but it is permeable. So, so uh, there is some porosity in it. Uh, but very, very, very small, and in the limit of very, very small permeability, uh, uh, the solution in the fluid domain uh, converges to the solution with no slip boundary condition for a perfectly impermeable solid. Uh, so in practice, we uh, don't set this equal to zero, but uh, we set it to a sufficiently small, a small uh, value. Uh, uh, well, this can also be understood uh, as a uh, uh, but by just considering uh, two terms of this equation, so time derivative of uh, u and uh, this uh, penalty term. So in each subdomain, uh, we have uh, for this equation two, dis two, two different uh, behaviors. Uh, in the fluid, uh, the initial condition is conserved. In the solid, we have this exponential damping, and the solution goes to the uh, uh, velocity of the solid inside the solid domain. But now when we have uh, the uh, viscous term included, there will be some transition, some boundary layer that uh, connects uh, between these two uh, extremes. And uh, uh, well, this is a simple example of uh, what uh, uh, the uh, velocity uh, profile in one of the simplest cases looks like. So we have, uh, for example, a channel flow with forced mean flow velocity. And this is all solid, and uh, we impose periodic boundary conditions. So uh, we have also a solid wall here, solid wall here. And uh, the black line is a solution with uh, exact no slip boundary condition. And you see that the velocity goes to zero. But with volume penalization method, uh, we get almost the same velocity profile. Uh, but here, if we zoom, there is some mismatch and there is some uh, internal boundary layer inside the solid domain, which means that there is some small velocity inside the solid. But uh, it is, uh, the error is getting smaller as, we, uh, uh, as uh, the uh, penalization parameter tends to zero. So we get the blue line, and eventually we get a very close match. Uh, uh, so uh, this is how we impose the no-slip boundary conditions. This is one of the components of the method uh, to model this complex shape. Uh, now, okay, uh, what do we get now for our fluid or for our domain? Now we get a uh, uh, fluid and the solid, uh, which are described by the same equation. So uh, we can uh, impose a very simple shape uh, for the exterior boundary of this domain. And we just uh, use uh, a periodic uh, a, a, a rectangular box domain. Uh, and we use uh, a full absurdist spectral method for discretization of our equation. Uh, so we will have periodic boundary condition. Uh, why we are using full absurdist spectral method? Because uh, it is a very well developed already uh, for turbulence simulation. So we imported uh, the numerical methods that were developed uh, previously in the context of uh, homogeneous isotropic turbulence, but we just included some, uh, some uh, solid obstacles in this flow. Uh, so there are many advantages uh, for using four episode spectral method. Uh, well, I list them here. It's, uh, well, one of them is the Laplace operator is uh, diagonal, so we will not have uh, uh, any uh, uh, linear system solver to implement. Uh, it is suitable for large supercomputers. I'm going to speak about it a bit later. Uh, and uh, the time marching is uh, uh, out of special for Swiss integrating factor. I'm going to explain it a little bit later. Uh, now to get into more details. Uh, 
uh, of that. Uh, so uh, fast Fourier transform and uh, inverse fast Fourier transform are the main building blocks of our numerical method, and they are they can contain uh, most of the computational complexity. So this is the most uh, complex part of the solver. Uh, uh, but then uh, once uh, we made the transform, uh, it is very cheap to compute the derivatives. Uh, well, advantage. Uh, very well-known numerical dissipation and diffusion. Uh, but uh, there are some problems to evaluate uh, the nonlinear terms. So to evaluate the nonlinear terms, uh, we do it in physical space. So multiple times we have to apply this uh, fast Fourier transform in its inverse. Uh, and uh, another uh, artifact, that, well, we can call it artifact, is that the natural boundary conditions are periodic. But now we have some problem here because, uh, well, usually we want to just uh, make a simulation of one insect flying. We don't want the whole uh, infinity of insects flying together. So we have to do something with the periodic boundary conditions that we have. Uh, fortunately, uh, we can use the same uh, penalty uh, approach uh, uh, to penalize uh, the vorticity which is transported. So the vortex wake can be also penalized in this uh, what we call vorticity sponge uh, by applying similar uh, technique uh, on the vorticity. And then, well, this is a biosovar operator uh, that uh, allows us to uh, calculate the velocity from the known vorticity. And then, uh, as shown in this example video, the vortex wake uh, from a solid uh, sphere in this case, which would re-enter the computational domain from uh, the upstream side, it is, uh, it is uh, damped uh, in the vorticity sponge. Uh, well, uh, now a few words about the incompressibility treatment. So, well, if you take a divergence of the momentum equation, uh, which we'll write in this formulation with uh, this uh, uh, capital pi for the uh, pressure. Uh, uh, we uh, obtain this equation, which can be readily solved uh, if we Fourier transform it. Uh, what is important to note here that uh, not only the nonlinear term uh, is not in general divergence free, but also this uh, penalty term is in general not divergence free. So we have to include it uh, uh, in the in, when we compute the pressure. Uh, well, the time marching scheme, as I said, uh, is Adam Spechwurz, but uh, since uh, the viscous term is uh, linear uh, in uh, Fourier space, uh, we can treat it uh, using uh, integration factors, uh, which is shown in this slide. So, and that's, then this integral is uh, discretized using, using Adam Spechwurz scheme. Uh, so, a few words about the software. So. These were all numerical methods behind. Uh, now, our objective was really to uh, be able to run this solver on massive, on uh, uh, highly parallel computers. So most computations are done on BlueGene, have been done on BlueGene. Uh, the uh, code has modular structure. It is a Fortran 90 code, MPI parallel. So it is a... Uh, uh, using well-tuned uh, fast Fourier transform libraries, uh, uh, namely FFTW and P3D FFT. I'm going to speak about those ones. Uh, for input-output, uh, the code is using parallel 8K5 format. And uh, all these libraries, as well as the main code, are open source. They are all on GitHub. So you can download this code and play with it uh, if you have a parallel computer. Uh, well, a parallel computer can be emulated on any computer now, so it can be tested on any machine. Uh, so, as I said, uh, the uh, FFT, fast Fourier transform, is the most expensive part of this uh, method. So, uh, I'm going to speak a bit more about it. Uh, we use a P3D FFT library for the domain decomposition. This is a pencil decomposition, which uh, uh, the good part of this decomposition is uh, that uh, it can be used uh, when you have many, 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 many com uh, computational cores. Uh, 
so one approach would be to decompose just in one direction, but then uh, the number of the cores that you use is limited by the number of grid points in this direction. Uh, so then, uh, well, the solution is to split in the second direction. But we don't split in the third direction because this is the direction where we compute the uh, Fourier transform. So basically what we do, we compute Fourier transform in uh, this direction, then uh, we uh, transpose the data such that uh, another direction uh, is uh, contiguous uh, on each uh, core and we Fourier transform uh, locally uh, in this direction and we transpose again Fourier transform in this direction. Uh, so all communication is uh, uh, taken care of by uh, this uh, library. Uh, and uh, the serial Fourier transform uh, is uh, FFTW on one uh, processor. So as I said, uh, the computations that I'm going to show, most of them have been uh, carried out on Blue Gene, uh, well, which has this uh, number of cores memory and so on. Uh, this is just to show you that the code scales well when the uh, problem is large enough and usually we're, well now even larger than 768 uh, grid points cube. So we can go up to 8,000 cores. Uh, okay, and I'm going to show you some simulations of insects. Uh, the morphology of insects uh, is as complete as we can. So this is the, uh, the wing shape, the body shape. Uh, well, basically the, 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 these elements of the body, we, we have them because we, we can have them with volume penalty method. Uh, it can have degrees of freedom and uh, the wing kinematics is usually prescribed with three angles because these are solid bodies. Uh, so this is uh, the typical time evolution of the uh, wing angle. Mm. Well, uh, where does this data come from? That's a different question. So actually as, as a complex question as uh, developing the software, uh, now we have this uh, tool that uh, can uh, uh, simulate uh, insects flying, but where do we uh, take the data? And the data, as much as we can, comes from the actual experiments. So uh, uh, you can buy uh, a box with bumblebees, for example, uh, and it's delivered by post. It is buzzing when you take it. Uh, looks scary. Then you open it, you put these, uh, well, the hive uh, is here, then bees need some. Uh, uh, space for, well, th this is a feeding arena where they have food, uh, the sugar water solution, some artificial flowers, and uh, a channel uh, where they can fly back and forth. And then, uh, you, well, we, we took uh, high-speed cameras and filmed uh, the wing kinematics, and that was used uh, as input uh, for the wing motion for the bees uh, we constructed in 3D. So another point is uh, the uh, morphology, the geometry of the body, that now can be taken, well this is actually future work, uh, not yet ready, but uh, the plan is to take it from uh, the micro CT scan of the, of the bee, and uh, ultimately we really want to have this uh, realistic uh, uh, geometry of the body, because we actually don't know which parts are important, and some, some researchers claim that uh, when bees extend legs, there might be some aerodynamic effects. So before you, you start your simulation, or before you start developing your code, you don't exactly know which, uh, which uh, questions you are going to explore. So from that point of view, it's nice to have a well, volume penalization method in our case, or a most boundary methods, because they allow you to uh, quickly adapt your code to these questions. Uh, Okay, well, so some numerical validation. Uh, well, on this slide, on a simple example, a rectangular wing that uh, moves back and forth uh, with these uh, prescribed uh, angles. And uh, I compare with uh, some previous study using lattice Boltzmann, and you see that the result by Fluse, which is our code, and the reference simulations are, the agreement is quite good, the red and blue line here. A bit more complex case uh, is uh, a fruit fly hovering, uh, so same kind of situation, the fruit fly is just staying on, 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 on one place and moving the wings like that. And uh, again, I compute the uh, vertical force 
and the aerodynamic power and uh, well after some transient uh, which is uh, which is uh, an artifact of impulsive stars after that the agreement is again quite good especially in terms of mean of force and power uh, it is less than uh, three and one percent uh, difference respectively yeah well so that was a uh, uh, the numerical method now would like to, ah, so okay, well, well one thing that I did with just uh, before presenting. Uh, so, okay, we uh, know how to impose the Nosland boundary condition on the fluid. Another useful uh, application of the volume penalization approach is uh, to impose no flux uh, condition on a passive scalar. So we can have some passive scalar transported in the fluid. And for us, uh, this can be order tracking. I'll maybe go back and show the video again. Okay, so it can be order tracking. Oh, it doesn't work. So, oh, 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 oh. Okay. No, nah, sorry about that. So it can be order tracking, and uh, there may be some passive scalar uh, vectored by the fluid. Uh, so we might want uh, to solve the passive scalar transport equation together with uh, the Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, well, we can do that uh, again. Uh, well, this is the equation we want to solve with no flux boundary condition at the surface of the animal. Uh, we uh, modify the uh, uh, equation as follows. So this is to impose the no flux, and this is to impose the transport of the passive uh, scalar if there's any inside the solid body or if there's none. Uh, again, uh, here uh, we have a, a parameter eta theta, which uh, is a small uh, value. And uh, as it goes to zero, the solution of this uh, problem uh, with uh, periodic boundary conditions goes to the solution of this problem with uh, well, again, periodic boundary condition on the exterior and the uh, zero flux on the solid surface. Okay, now I'm going to speak a little bit about the applications of this uh, software. Uh, well, you know that uh, uh, animals were previously studied in laboratory, usually in uh, quiescent flow conditions, but in nature, of course, uh, they fly in turbulent conditions. And uh, it was observed that, for example, bees go foraging in a very strong wind. Uh, so the question is uh, now, OK, we know many things about how insects fly in uh, quiescent air. But do they fly the same way in the turbulent environment? And this is one of the questions currently explored uh, in insect flight research. Uh, so that's where we thought, ah, well, the numerical simulation might be useful here. Uh, because actually we can model, uh, we can simulate turbulence, we can simulate insects, why not try and see what uh, uh, the questions are, what forces uh, are uh, developed by flapping wings when they fly in turbulence and how insects control their flight in turbulence. So these were the main questions that we had. Uh, there, there have been some experimental work uh, previously on bumblebees, on hawk moth, on hummingbirds. So uh, there were some questions already asked uh, from these experiments and some guesses. But the advantage of numerical simulations and that we have perfect control about all parameters that we have. In the animal experiments, it is really difficult to tell the animal to do what, what you expect it to do. Um, here, you, of course, it's less realistic, but there are uh, much less uh, control parameters, and you, you, you can control all of them perfectly. Uh, so we uh, took our model a bumblebee, put it in a rectangular domain. Uh, well, this shows a simulation with a uniform inflow velocity of 2.5 meters per second, uh, which is representative of a bumblebee. But then what we did, we added uh, a turbulent fluctuation on top of our uh, this velocity. And we wanted to see how the uh, mean aerodynamic forces change if we add this turbulent fluctuation. Now the question is uh, what fluctuation to add? Well, one of the simple uh, cases is just the homogeneous isotropic turbulence because it is relatively well uh, explored. 
So we pre-computed uh, some turbulent fluctuation field uh, using uh, known techniques. Uh, well, this is to show that uh, it does have some uh, uh, expected spectrum, well, the decay of energy uh, spectrum in uh, our computation. And then we took this pre-computed turbulent fluctuation and superposed it uh, on the inset light computation. Uh, so now it's not enough to make just one simulation here because we actually want to see how the mean, uh, well, the statistical averages uh, of forces uh, uh, depend on the turbulence intensity. So we uh, uh, repeated this kind of simulation with different realizations of uh, inflow turbulence and then took the uh, uh, statistical moments, uh, computed the statistical moments of forces and torques. Uh, this is uh, just an example of uh, flow visualization of the uh, vorticity uh, magnitude uh, for two different uh, uh, values of the turbulence intensity. But we are really interested in the forces, and this uh, diagram uh, summarizes uh, how the uh, aerodynamic forces and torques vary with the turbulence intensity at the inflow. So the, this line with uh, crosses, the solid line, shows the mean horizontal force, uh, well, the, yeah, the, the mean uh, horizontal force, the uh, mean vertical force, the mean lateral force, power, roll torque, uh, pitch torque, and so on. And which is impressive here, uh, we vary the turbulence intensity from zero to almost 100%. So, so this is a very, very strong turbulence. The, the animal is flying through as strong turbulence as its own wings generate, for example. Uh, and uh, the average vertical force does not change at all. So it's not sensitive to turbulence at all, which is quite a nice result, uh, which uh, is very uh, counterintuitive for, for uh, aircraft engineering, for example, because airplanes, they stall in a very, very weak turbulence. 10% is already enormous. But here, uh, it's, the flapping wings are not sensitive to turbulence at all. I'm going to give an explanation why. But what it, they are sensitive to, uh, what is sensitive uh, to turbulence? is, of course, the uh, uh, variation of uh, this force. So, of course, uh, the, the force varies much, much more when uh, the turbulence is strong. Uh, so here, the body of the animal is fixed, but if the body of the animal is allowed to rotate, then this variation is going to be important. Uh, so, now to uh, look into detail uh, in this flow, what is going on here, uh, uh, so the uh, wings actually have sharp edge here. So that's why the flow separates regardless of uh, either it's small turbulence intensity or large, we have the same kind of separated flow. Uh, so, and this is uh, what differs from the streamlined airfoil because in the streamlined airfoil there may be flow separation but there is no flow separation uh, in the uh, uh, very smooth air, let's say. Uh, here we always have flow separation, uh, and uh, that's why on average it uh, is stronger than the inflow turbulence. Uh, but as I said, uh, the variation of the torque uh, increases with the uh, turbulence intensity. That's why uh, if the body is allowed to rotate, the uh, angular velocity uh, can reach larger values when uh, the turbulence intensity is larger. And that, the conjecture here is that actually the flight through turbulence for insects is rather limited by their control, well, their, their control <coughs> sensor capacity rather than the aerodynamics of the flapping wings. Uh, well, these are the conclusions that I just said. Uh, so the mean forces are not, not sensitive to turbulence, but the variance increases of flight control may become a constraint. Okay, and the second topic is, well, the first, well, we showed that uh, when the body is fixed, uh, insects are very robust, but 
something may happen when the body can move. So now let's actually see what happens when uh, an actual bee flies uh, through turbulent uh, inflow. And uh, this is from uh, early experiments by Schrader Rabe, uh, who uh, considered bumblebee flying in a von Karman street in a vortex wake behind the cylinder in the wind tunnel. So there's some inflow cylinder, vortex weight here. And you see that uh, there are some wiggles on top of the trajectory of, the, of these uh, markers attached to the bee. Uh, so if we compare flight uh, in, uh, in uh, uniform uh, laminar inflow and flight uh, in uh, turbulent inflow, uh, that is uh, this, uh, well, this picture and this picture, you see there is much more oscillation when it is in turbulence. And the oscillation here is obviously due to uh, the von Karman street, the vortex wake, and uh, this wake uh, has uh, its own frequency. We can see that oscillation is uh, on the frequency of the, of the vortex street. Uh, now, the question is, do animals try to compensate for this perturbation? Do they try to fight turbulence, or, or, or do they just uh, let the turbulence move them uh, and they passively go through? Uh, so, well, first, uh, what we did, we uh, high-pass filtered and low-pass filtered the uh, data that I showed previously, and we see that there is a, a slow motion, slow mode, which is the same uh, in a turbulent uh, environment or in smooth air environment. Uh, and this slow uh, dynamics is uh, what we call helicopter mode. So the animal inclines uh, its uh, uh, aerodynamic force vector to go left or right. Uh, and this uh, mode can be explained. Uh, well, I'm not going through details here, but just to say that uh, the slow motion is essentially the same in a uh, no, smooth air and in turbulent air. But now, in, when it flies in, in turbulent air, we saw some wiggles, uh, some small oscillations. So the high-pass filter data shows a very different relation between the lateral acceleration and the roll angle. So the conjecture was that maybe, uh, uh, well, can this be passive? We wanted to test that. And to test this uh, conjecture, we are uh, oh, skipping this. We carried out another numerical simulation of the same kind of bumblebee uh, in the wake of a cylinder. So very similar setup, but now we have a cylinder here, uh, inflow velocity again at 2.5 meters per second, but the bumblebee can uh, roll and that it can move laterally. But it cannot stabilize itself. So the wing motion is just periodic, same as before. Uh, and uh, here I'm going to show a visualization of uh, this uh, numerical simulation. So again, this is vorticity magnitude. Uh, so that's here, the vort that's where the von Karman vortex street starts. And then it hits the bumblebee, it rolls. And when it rolls, it starts moving laterally. Now you don't see it, but now, now you see that it's moving. And it's recovering passively because there is some built-in uh, passive stability mechanism. Uh, and then it, well, continues flying. So now, well, this is uh, just a still image visualization of the same flow. So you see that there is some lateral wind that influences the bumblebee. Uh, now, we get the angular displacement and the lateral displacement. We get the lateral acceleration uh, and the angular acceleration, which are the uh, dashed line here. Now we high pass filter this data, and we see uh, in the high pass filter, we see again oscillation on the von Karman frequency. And now, if we superpose this with uh, the black lines, which are from uh, experiments we see that the amplitude, not just the frequency, but the amplitude uh, is the same uh, in the numerical simulation and the, the experiment. So this suggests that maybe, uh, maybe for this, uh, 
let's say, mild but still relatively large turbulence, the animal actually is not trying to compensate for, uh, for this perturbation. It just goes with the flow. Uh, of course, it's maybe not always the case, but it turned out that in all cases that were considered in the previous experiment that were biologically relevant, uh, the animal did not compensate for this aerodynamic perturbation. So the numerical simulation helped to answer this question, and then we could make some uh, reduced order modeling again to explain this mode. I'm not going through the details, just jumping to the conclusions to say that, uh, okay, another conclusion is that uh, Bumblebee experiences high frequency buffeting. This motion is purely passive, and uh, the insects do not compensate for it at all. Another result is that uh, even without any uh, imposed uh, stabilization mechanism, uh, this uh, two degrees of freedom model is remarkably stable to lateral perturbation. Uh, and uh, this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention.